Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andy Hopper, and I'm here uh, on behalf of the Council of the Royal Society. Um, did I make sure that your phones are switched off and off means off? Because even in silent, you'll get the beep, 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 beep roaming. So thank you very much. And uh, the event is being webcast uh, today. So uh, uh, when it comes to questions, uh, please be aware of that. I'll remind you, stand up, uh, kindly stand up and uh, wait for the microphone. And then we'll get the sound and the uh, video. Now, many of you will know that uh, this year it's uh, the 350th anniversary of the Royal Society. In fact, the actual date is the 30th so of November, so it's just coming up in a couple of weeks' time. And uh, if I could, uh, you've seen some of it on the slides, if I could uh, commend to you some of the things which are still to come, uh, some of the events and some of the uh, uh, previous things that have happened uh, this year. For example, uh, this report, uh, The Scientific Century, uh, I would suggest makes very good reading and had, I hope, some influence in the comprehensive uh, spending review of late. Uh, see further, the Festival of Science and Arts and the associated Summer Science uh, Exhibition, uh, where the website is uh, still up and uh, worthy of uh, a look. And um, there is a local heroes uh, program uh, where in various locations around the UK, uh, prominent uh, fellows of the Royal Society and others as local heroes are explained in various museums and science centres. Uh, and there is also a capital science program uh, uh, here in the capital. So today's lecture is by Nigel Shadbolt. Nigel is a professor of artificial intelligence at the University of Southampton and with Sir Tim Berners-Lee has been developing open data technology and policy for UK government. And he's still sane, so that's good. Uh, his research is directed to the development of the next generation web and the establishment of web science. No doubt we'll hear of that. And uh, he's also a former president of the British Computer Society, and his presidency was in the 50th uh, year of that society, which I guess must have been uh, of some uh, pleasure. Um, and uh, today's uh, lecture, uh, as you can see, is entitled Opening the Information Floodgates, the Technologies and Challenges of a Web of Linked Data. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to present Professor Nigel Shadbot. Well, thank you very much, Andy, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And to those of you out there uh, watching now on the live Royal Society TV feed and in the future, it's quite hard to introduce in this virtual age. In fact, it's a great pleasure to see many of you here tonight physically because in this age, many people attend uh, just virtually. In fact, my uh, own students are on beer and pizzas down in Southampton, by and large, watching the, uh, the TV feed. Um, so I understand also, as well as being streamed, uh, the talk's going to be available in a few days on the Society's website. So it's all very digital. So just to say, this, tonight's, what I want to talk about is a story really that's in three parts. The extraordinary rates of change in compute power, memory networks, data, and the web itself, and why we've got to therefore understand the largest information infrastructure the world has ever seen, the web. And the second looks at the emergence of a new kind of web, a web of linked data, and uh, one area with which I'm involved, which is uh, seeing rapid change, open government data. And finally, we'll consider the challenges uh, that this deluge of data presents, technical and societal. Now, of course, meeting here at the world's oldest scientific society, we have to recognize that data has always been crucial. Copernicus, Copernicus was working 14... Uh, 90 through 1540, uh, detailed observations and data relating to the position of the planets and other astronomical bodies revolutionized the way we thought about uh, our place, literally, in the universe. 
or Vesalius working in the 1530s to try and understand from data and observations just how the human body was constituted and worked. From Galileo to Newton, Rutherford to Crick and Watson, data's been crucial. And of course, it still is in the age of the Human Genome Project, Large Hadron Collider. So just before we move on, with all this talk of data, um, I'll tend to use data and information interchangeably uh, tonight. And that actually reflects usage, database, web of data. But in fact, when I used to work in, well, I still work in AI, but when I used to work building expert and knowledge-based systems, we were always at pains to distinguish data, data from information from knowledge. So data, 110, from information that 110 is my current heart rate, from knowledge that elevated heart rate can be caused by a degree of nervousness. Okay? So that difference, that grade, is important. Uh, but I would tend to say that most of you will hear tonight, uh, what you'll hear about is actually information. We know what the data represents, that 110 here represents my heart rate or the speed of a vehicle or the cost of a parking find. So with those preliminaries, let's look at the rates of change in the areas of concern tonight. So that graph often put up there, it's a reflection of what we call Moore's Law. The remarkable thing about this uh, rates of change graph. This is the power of basic uh, compute processes available to us from about 1970 to 2010. For me personally, since I began work in AI and computer science, that graph has meant that there has been a million-fold increase in compute power, which means almost everything we used to think wouldn't be solvable by a brute force method, many of them have succumbed to methods, even though we knew that trajectory. So that slope tells us there are remarkable changes afoot. And in memory, that graph is telling us that in 10 years or so, it'll be possible to store the entire awake life of people on whatever passes for a chunky laptop of the time. Okay? So that's a remarkable change in the ability to store information. Or this, which tells us more or less, you can't know for sure exactly how much data we're generating. New prefixes to the byte, the megabyte, the gigabyte, the terabyte, the exabyte, big numbers. So currently, um, people estimate that in 2007, 281 exabytes or 281 trillion digitized novels or thereabouts. What we expect to see is... 1.8 zettabytes in 2011. The interesting thing about that is that's about twice as much data as we will have physical ability to store it with every storage device we currently have. A lot of this data will be generated and evaporate literally into the ether. So those rates of change mean that everything in our world changes at rates and in ways that are quite remarkable, and nothing more remarkable than the web itself. And we all look at this. Um, this is a slide due to a, a student, Southampton, Mark Schuler, where we look at, you know, when I first encountered the web, it was about 1994. I saw it over a telephone modem at a conference in Canada on a Mosaic browser. And still then, there were just a really rather few number of users and hosts. It had been around for a few years, and it was growing actually just as fast at that point in terms of rates of change as it has continued to do, but it really wasn't really commanding attention. As time has gone on, of course, and here we have the number of users. Again, this is pretty approximate. A um, uh, um, uh, number of um, hosts here, sorry, a number of users here. You can begin to see uh, uh, people roughly calculate that one point well, getting on for 1,800 million users. Okay, so extraordinary numbers of users. Still nothing like the entire planet. There's still a huge amount to do in terms of inequalities and in terms of access. But as we've seen these changes, these um, exponential uh, increases in uh, the take-up, the amount of available compute power, the memory storage. We've seen the birth of a whole range of new capabilities. As the, go as, as the web got to a certain size, the need to search it efficiently became paramount. Google was born indexing 
tens of millions of pages. Uh, at the last count that they were putting out, uh, he had indexed over a trillion. Okay. So the size of the data ahead of us in this new world is truly extraordinary. And, of course, it requires some pretty nifty engineering, in fact, some pretty substantially clever science and analysis to work out how you are going to index a web that is growing as fast as this number of users are able to generate content. And this is actually some of the really fascinating aspects of the science of the web, how you manage these rates of scale and change. So that web graph tells us that the web is easily the most successful information architecture in history. Uh, it's, it's creator, Tim Berners-Lee, here, looking for reflective. His famous uh, initial memo to uh, his boss at CERN, uh, Mike Sandel, to actually talk about doing where he had to submit it twice, uh, famously, and his boss uh, actually said at the time, vague but exciting. It's great when engineers or scientists are given a chance to take a vague and exciting idea and work on it. Uh, the great thing that Tim says about this note was that he wasn't told no. Okay, he could get on and develop the concept. Now, what's happened in the meantime is that we have built a structure, and you can image it in lots of beguiling ways, that we do not fully understand. Because in many areas, the web is manifesting emergent <coughs> behavior and properties. It's a simple architecture, in fact. But these protocols and this architecture at scale gives rise to very complex phenomena. And actually, many systems in nature are like this. One of the things a number of us are proposing is that we actually need a systems-oriented view of the web to understand the web, that actually the web is an ecosystem of people and machines, and the interactions between them are complex phenomena that we need to understand. We need to understand the web as a social and a technical system. And uh, a number of us have been writing about this uh, in a number of places. Uh, when we launched this concept back in 2006, Web Science, we call it, uh, we were trying essentially to get the community to imagine that there was a need to understand this information fabric, the properties it had, and that this would be a pretty good way to reach out to a new generation of our brightest and best engineers and scientists, entrepreneurs, to think about this thing that pervaded their life everywhere, but we didn't really fully understand. And in fact, uh, rather pleasingly, just a, a month or so ago, we held here at the Royal Society a discussion, a discussion meeting where we brought together some of the really important research and researchers from around the world on web science. Um, actually, those lectures are now available here uh, at the Royal Society's own uh, events website, where we were looking to explore what we know of the web now and where the challenges lay in the future. And this recognition, I think, is important, this recognition that there is an object of serious scientific study and inquiry, an object that demands exquisite engineering. So what do we know of the web? Well, we know something about its shape and structure. So however we image the pages and the links between them, they're often quite beautiful and they're often quite compelling. And they often fly in the face of what we might have expected. When people first started to think about what the links between the pages meant in terms of a structure, uh, they reached for a branch of mathematics, graph theory. And there were some, some, some assumptions around at the time as to what the web graph might look like. Some people thought it might actually be a relatively even distribution of connectivity. But it turns out not to be like that at all. There is no democratic of distribution of links on the web. So the distribution of links going into web pages doesn't look anything like this bell curve. It looks much more like what we call a power law distribution. Some pages are massively linked to, are highly important and central in the web graph. Other important pages will often link to other important pages. In fact, the basis of the the Google uh, result in terms of how you work out what pages are most important or more important than others is based on this recursive um, uh, enumeration of important pages pointing to other important pages and giving them a rank. So we understand something about the structure and shape of the web. 
the fact it actually uh, shows uh, what's called a scale-free property, um, that it, anywhere you look on this uh, graph of link structure, it looks the same if you move a little bit further in terms of the degree of connectivity. We know something about what the exponent of that connection is. We know that the web has this small world structure that actually you can get across the web in a relatively few number of clicks from one page to any other because the web is organized into areas of interest or authority. And that's because people's interests are reflected partly in web structure. And we can use some very nifty analysis and analytics on this web structure to determine where the hubs and authorities are, where the important parts of the web are. And whatever we, uh, whenever we look at this structure, the topology of the web, we're able to use it in some really quite compelling ways, from security through to ranking and uh, determining the importance of, of pages, through to working out whether a social network is particularly well connected. As we look at the web, the web phenomena, we see remarkable emergence from these simple principles. One of them, famously, is a phenomenon like Wikipedia, a collectively authored set of content, which, whatever the school teachers will tell you or not, at the heart, the most highly connected, because the pages and articles of Wikipedia also follow a power law distribution. So there are some that are highly, highly linked to become the core important articles is that you look in that core, there is huge stability. Okay. At the edge, maybe, there are disputed pages and articles. There are stuff that's being constantly re-edited that cause people uh, uh, a degree of nervousness when it's read and, report, read and rep reported back. But at its core, this is a collectively authored endeavor which has a surprisingly small number of egregious errors in the core. Perhaps no more than carefully authored and annotated encyclopedic works of the sort that we're used to. Now, how does that happen? Web science is looking to answer the questions of how stability emerges from this collective effort. The other remarkable thing we see is emergence just from the sheer amount of activity. Now, this is a picture of geographic uploads. The light here is the upload rates for Flickr. Flickr pictures, the pictures we take all the time and upload. Uh, this is actually taken from a, a great talk at the discussion meeting here by John Kleinberg, uh, which again is available on the, uh, on the, on the Royal Society uh, events uh, page. The entire discussion meeting was, uh, was recorded and the talks are all available. Because if we take one area, let's take London, these are the geospatial uploads of the photographs, the Flickr uploads about London. You can see the map of London. Perhaps not. As soon as you think about it, you think, well, of course, you know, there is so much activity in London, capital city, dozens of pictures being taken on the bridges and the major thoroughfares. But it's still a compelling and beguiling vision when you see it. What can we learn from that? Is this a new kind of data mining? And the fact, of course, that when people upload their pictures, they tag them, means that with a little bit of automatic processing, you begin to find out where the tourist hotspots are, what the major landmarks are, in a data-driven way from this kind of large-scale activity on the web. Lots of data, lots of people connected in a common endeavor, emergent property. Or this, one of my favorite examples from Louis Van Arn's work, uh, these are captures. Uh, the, uh, in fact, Louis Van Arn uh, developed this idea. How do you tell when you come to a website that you're a person and not a program or a robot that somebody has written to try and log in and uh, acquire a user account? Many sites now are automated, and if you can log on to the site, you can get an email account generated. You can use that email account then. Uh, to promote spam, to uh, propagate all sorts of uh, distorting effects on the web. So Lewis's work came up with the notion that can we find a task that could sort out the programs from the people? And being able to take a uh, difficult to read, uh, we will have all done these, probably going to sites, where you see a distorted word and you've got to type in what that is. It's a version of, a micro version of the Turing test to find out whether you're actually a person or current, today's current version of, uh, of, 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 of a program. Now, what Louis van Arn did rather beautifully was 
realize that in doing that, you're devoting a piece of your four billion year old endowment, your smart intelligence, to solve a difficult task. Now, there are lots of difficult tasks that we might want to do together, uh, or not even know we're doing, that might be to benefit. So a word that an optical character recognition program, an optical character recognition program would find difficult, here's one of them. As Google is trying to scan the world's literature, <laughs> what of it? As it's trying to go back to earlier manuscripts that are very hard to make out, OCR is having lots of difficulties. Many words are not recognized. So guess what? Uh, in, in many of these sites now that you come to, one of them is an actual word that will let you in. Another is a word that has been presented to help you, uh, to, to help the, uh, the effort here in some small way. So this will be a word that's been put there from a hard-to-read text. Okay? They are now recognizing 18 million digitized words a day by having a number of people get the same hard-to-read word and then looking for the commonality and deciding on what that word likely is. So this is taking a tiny bit of your human processing cycle and stealing it for another end, right? And using it at scale to now digitize at a vast rate a difficult and hard thing to do. There are emergence, of course, in networks. So networks, here we have... Uh, Social networks, which we're familiar with, we know there are implicitly and intrinsically and explicitly all sorts of interesting patterns there. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is a picture of the blogosphere, uh, created by Matthew Hurst, uh, and in fact representing uh, areas where bloggers are self-organizing themselves into communities, important communities, important blog sites where every, every, everybody reports into. And we know that the numbers in social networks are truly amazing. Um, in Facebook, something like 200 million daily active users. It's debated just what active means here, but these are very large numbers. In China, uh, uh, Wendy Hall and I have just come back from China, uh, Tencent or QZone claims 305 million active users. So, although the numbers might be a little bit suspect, we know it's a lot. And you can begin to imagine all sorts of effects that people networked at this scale uh, might be able to produce and lead to. And indeed, something that we are now able to offer up to not just the marketing department, but social science itself as a fascinating new insight, a fascinating new instrument into the essence and scale of human interaction and behavior just beginning now to see the effects, as we saw again at the discussion meeting, the effects of this on the scientific disciplines themselves. So web science, we believe, is, is important and timely. And we also start to notice emergence in networks that are of a different kind. So the second part of the talk, I want to move on to a new kind of network we're observing. And this is a network of what we call the web of data. In about 2007, we had the first inklings of this new kind of network. This is a um, so-called linked open data cloud. This represents data represented in a way that I'll, 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 I'll explain in a, in a little while. Um, a new kind of uh, uh, exploitation of the web pro protocol to represent new data sets. So here, for example, is about an 8 million... Uh, sized gazetteer of geographical place names and facts called geonames. Um, it's worldwide, it's open, you can go there and find out all sorts of interesting uh, facts about places and spaces around the world. There's this one which I'll talk about in a little, in a little while as well, DPpedia, which is the facts within the four million articles of Wikipedia extracted into a network of basic facts and data elements. So these have started to appear around about 2007. People were using this new format, uh, this new set of uh, web protocols to link and connect and represent information, not at the page level, but at the atomic fact level. And about six months later, we looked at it, and in 2008, more had joined. And a little later, yet more. 
And we're seeing a characteristic emergence. If you begin to plot this, we see many of the power laws uh, that we see in other aspects of, of dramatic web growth. And in September of this year, we see yet more. Trillions of triples of data representing, actually, interestingly, whole areas of interest. So a chunk of this linked open data web to do with the life sciences and biology. A chunk to do with publications. Why will academics get into these technologies early? They tend to. A lot of the uh, digital libraries are being represented now in this kind of way. Um, geography here. Some social uh, media sites were early adopters of this approach. And here, government data. Data on everything from transport to education from roads to schools, from energy to spending, as we'll see. Now, this web of data is really just, it's not a replacement to, it's an adjunct to the web of documents. When Tim Berners-Lee gave us the web of documents, what he was doing, of course, was taking the internet, which allowed us to connect, in a virtual fashion, our machine processes together, and realized that on many and many, many of the machines, there were document management systems, which meant it was very difficult to get from one page to another, one document management system to another. So he could put a thin layer of protocols that related to documents in particular, a hypertext system across the internet. What would that look like? Was his proposal and his engineered solution uh, with Robert Cayo gave us uh, the uh, first uh, emergence of the World Wide Web, connecting web documents together. And here, what we're trying to do is carry that process further and take simple protocols to connect not just the pages, but perhaps the facts within pages, or the cells within an Excel spreadsheet, or a spreadsheet of any kind, or the elements of a database, and treat them as if they were linkable to, as elements. And this is a simple set of principles. Uh, it had been around for a while when uh, Tim and, and Wendy and I wrote this paper, The Semantic Web Revisited. We were just trying to specify four simple principles, which had been enumerated, which we felt could work at scale to bring about a new form of the web. So very briefly, I'm going to talk about those principles. Uh, uh, bear with me for a few minutes, those of you uh, who are uh, not of a technical disposition, but it, just to give you a sense of how simple they are. The first principle is this notion of giving a web address, everything a web address, called a URI, a Uniform Resource Identifier. Um, you can see it looks a lot like a web address. This is a URI for a person at Southampton. This is that person as a number. That person as a number is me. Okay? And this is a project at Southampton, and this is a particular publication. It's meant to represent the entity itself. Okay? It's not... The description in English about it, it is in some sense a pure representation of the object of interest. Here is one from our data.gov site. This is a representation of a particular school in the UK. Okay. This is another person in another resource. Actually, this is me again. And that's actually an entry on uh, the linked data version of Wikipedia. Me again. This will bring us on to another issue later on. But your eyes for everything. And the trick about a URI is if I put that into a web browser, I get information back. Again, at this very simple level, a web of data, a triple, subject, verb, object, or object, predicate, object. It's a very simple representation. Here we've got that URI, one of the URIs for me put in, and here is, you can see, a much more structured representation of information. Other URIs here, all of these URIs here are actually the particular projects that at uh, the time this was uh, taken, the screen up was taken, I was actively involved with. So the vocabulary here and the facts that are linked are actually defined, again, in these new standards. Rather alarmingly, the notion of defining a vocabulary is called an ontology. It's the description of the things, the relationships that you're interested in. So you give things... And relations, anything in fact, a URI, you expect them to use the existing web protocol to get information back about them. 
Actually, what you get back is this rather simple knowledge representation language for the web, a very simple one that really doesn't uh, uh, um, go to the extremes of many AI knowledge representation languages that um, I knew and loved in my past, but has the interesting property of being able to scale, work at very large scale. And the other trick is that you can link these URIs together. And one way to link them is to declare that this URI is the same as this one, which is the same as this one. One thing we know about human behavior is that you cannot declare that this shall be the unique way of referring to something. Groups and communities have their own reasons to generate these web addresses. So you have to have ways of declaring things to be the same or different, similar or um, uh, in some other way related. And in fact, this web does exist, this web of linked data. People often worry that uh, this kind of talk is in advance of anything that actually exists. This is a, an interesting site called sig.ma, Sigma. It's uh, essentially a semantic web or a linked data search engine, and you can put in URIs or free text search and get back this structured view of the world. So it's out there now. And we build applications on the back of this. This was one that we built uh, uh, at Southampton a little while ago. Um, and it allows us to connect all those different resources, those databases that we talked about that were previously inaccessible, become connectable now. And we can look at, for example, uh, the world of academic uh, computer science, uh, the projects uh, that, 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 that people are involved with, the communities of practice they have, how projects are similar or different to one another, using the same kind of graph-based methods that are evolving to look at social networks, for example. So let's look in a little bit more detail about what the art of the possible is. So one of the very early things that emerged in our network of linked data was DPpedia. What is DPpedia? Well... It took Wikipedia, which has about 3 million things in its articles, more than 280,000 people, lots of places and species and diseases and music albums. There's a lot of stuff there being collectively authored. And it took the info boxes, which are and other things that are structured information in those web pages, and re-represented those as URIs using this new linked data format. It produced a thing called DBpedia. Now, the final bit of the picture was to develop a data access language that would work for the web in the same way that, say, SQL works for relational databases. It's a way of getting in and addressing and requesting information from this linked set of data. It's called Sparkle. We love completely impenetrable acronyms in this world, it appears. But here is a piece of Sparkle run against... DPpedia. This is saying, uh, try and find me, uh, try and find me all, all the countries which are landlocked, which have populations of more than 15 million. Actually, there's a bit missing here, because actually it would filter for language in the English language to give you this some result back. But there they are. Okay. Now, this starts to give you the beginnings of remarkable capability. The other interesting thing to notice here that these queries are using prefixes here that tell the system where to go to find the vocabularies that are going to be used in this query. So you don't have to have one monolithic agreement about which vocabulary is going to be apply, used to apply across all of uh, your queries. And this suits the way the web scales very well. And this is one of the reasons uh, that we're excited about the emergence of this new structure is that with ways of representing data, with ways of accessing it and storing it and addressing it, we can look at new possibilities. So now I'd like to move to the, um, the next part of the talk, which is to look at how this is being applied in open government. So back in 2005, uh, a research project that I was involved with had begun a, an experiment with uh, the Office of Public Sector Information, a part of government uh, that was charged with trying to make public information more available. And we'd gotten together a bunch of uh, organizations to look at whether this new way of representing information offered any interest. In fact, we had uh, uh, a publication submitted to Parliament back in 2007 where there was... Um, the project underlined the potential for the use of semantic web technology in large-scale integration of public sector information and the benefits such aggregation would bring. 
Well, that was back in 2007, and we slogged away, and it was a fond uh, sparkle uh, dream in our eyes. Uh, and then, actually, uh, Tim Berners-Lee uh, happened to be having uh, lunch with our previous prime minister, and the suggestion was made, uh, well, what can, uh, what can the government do uh, for the web? And famously, uh, Tim said, give us your data, um, which is a bit of an ask, really. Um, but at that point, uh, Tim and I were asked to, to, to set about creating a single point of access for public data. Uh, and we'll look into what exactly that means shortly. Um, in 2011, the site went public. Um, in, actually, after the election, um, the coalition government set up a thing called the Public Sector Transparency Board, one of whose tasks is to carry on doing this work. So the notion of open data has crossed political boundaries. And in fact, there seems almost to be now uh, a competition for ideas as to just what should be made open and how far you should go with this process. And that will partly inform some of the uh, challenges that we're going to face in the future. And what we're now seeing is that governments, local authorities, cities are now releasing open data. Now, open data doesn't mean, as I'm going to show, data using exactly those linked data standards because there are many ways you can represent it, but uh, it's a journey. Now, why do you publish public data at all? What are the arguments in favour of being open with public data? And by public data, what we actually mean is non-personal data that actually drives many of the public services, or indeed on which they're assessed, or on which decisions are made. And if you go to data.gov.uk, you'll find discussion around these, uh, uh, this, this very notion Transparency and accountability is one reason, to see what people are doing and hold uh, uh, governments and um, administrations to account. But also this data may have social and economic value. We'll have some look at some examples of that. Or maybe we can do more for less. Or maybe it's a way of engaging the citizen. There is a lot of discussion around how this movement will in fact uh, change the relationship between uh, the government and those who are governed in its name. Data.gov.uk itself has uh, almost 4,500 data sets, uses open source and open standards, which we're very pleased about. Uh, there is a commitment to linked data, so we'll, we'll look at that again, this, this new way of building a web of linked data. We've had key data sets that previously were difficult to obtain or accept without uh, uh, license or cost uh, restrictions uh, released. For example... The ordnance surveys, uh, geographic maps, postcodes, things that actually are quite important to our making sense of other data sets are now freely available. Spending data is more available. We have a new open government license for data. Uh, one of the interesting th restrictions in this uh, previously was that many of the data sets we wanted to use could not be used because of inappropriate licensing the restrictions you had, the fact that if you've got the information, you wouldn't be able to reuse it or republish it in electronic format. And we have a community of data users and developers. So all exciting stuff. Now, when you release data, uh, people get busy on it in ways you can never expect or anticipate. Uh, this is the eye-catching ASBORometer, which took a, a little loved and neglected spreadsheet from the Home Office, which had ASBO rates, and turned it into an Android and iPhone app, which was the top download, free download, for, 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 for quite some while in the UK. So you can wander around now with your, your iPhone app and actually uh, geolocate and find out what your ASBO rate is and what the categories of ASBOs, how many crack houses they've closed down recently in, in, close to Carlton uh, Terrace Gardens. Interesting stuff. Uh, or perhaps more kind of generally useful... Con uh, this, is, this, this, this was very interesting reuse of a data set that suddenly gained wide, wide appreciation and interest. And so did this one. Uh, find a national health dentist in your locale. Okay. But much more uh, uh, um, generically, uh, our ordnance survey data... So you had to pay to find out what, uh, and be able to use uh, postcode data until uh, just April of this year. Or indeed to be able to access many aspects of uh, geographic life. 
And now we can use ordnance surveys, wonderful maps, to plot all sorts of things, uh, because it turns out that geography links other data sets together in a quite unparalleled way. This is a heat map of where the pharmacies are in the UK. Uh, don't get a toothache or uh, in, the, in the Chilterns. Um, or this is bus stops. The National Access Point uh, uh, Transportation Network uh, mapping where all the bus stops... We'll come back to bus stops because they're particularly interesting. Or spending data. Where the government spends your data, both at a central and a local level. And in fact, excitingly, from January, uh, it's going to be a requirement that local authorities publish all their spending above £500, all their new spending. That will give an unparalleled ability to look at the types of service that are paid for, uh, where uh, money is going, um, whether one authority is acquiring a service in roughly the same price as another one. Um, it allows a new kind of debate. And interestingly, the applications that we see here were built within days of the data being released, not by government, but by the external developer world. So one of the largest arguments for this approach is that release the data and the applications are built, in some sense, by the community, by people who care about getting a good understanding of the data. The comprehensive, I mean, the, the, the actual coins data from the, uh, Her, Ma Her Majesty's Treasury, uh, there was a real concern when the Treasury were giving us this data about uh, uh, difficult to use, uh, massive, massive uh, spreadsheet with millions and millions of lines of data in it. Uh, difficult to decrypt, but within days, people had put uh, usable and navigable hyperlink browsers on top of the data. And uh, some people assert that some of these browsers are used uh, out of preference by those within government now. Okay, so it's a really interesting story. And this one just recently released, uh, this is real-time energy data that's driving an application developed uh, the idea for which is developed by a 16-year-old uh, uh, girl to actually give us a league table of uh, energy consumption, whether you're doing better than or worse than uh, an immediately previous uh, period of time. And this changes behavior. This data being released has visibly changed the energy consumption in government departments. People switch out the lights. They're a little bit more careful. They don't want to be at the bottom of this particular league table. Now, what's this got to do with linked data? Well, Tim, uh, uh, when Tim and I were working on this, Tim came up with this rather interesting characterization of how you can publish your open data. And we call it uh, kind of the, 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 the roadway to five stars, star quality. If you put your web on the data at all, you get one star. Okay? And some people think that they've done it when they've put their PDF file or their Word document on the file or they've actually given you a nice graphic with the curve showing your rates of spend. Well, you get a star, but it's much better if you can put it on uh, to uh, our data.gov.uk site as structured data or, ref or make your data available in, in say, an Excel in, or a, or a, or a uh, CSV file format instead of PDFs. So you get two stars for that. But if you use open standards, open non-proprietary standards, not linked to a particular vendor, you get three stars. And if you should think to actually associate URLs or URIs to identify things so that people and machines can point at that data, you get four. And if you link it to other people's data, you get five. So... We don't think that open government is perfection immediately. People will be publishing data and are publishing data on these open data sites at a li different level of star quality. And as yet, there's rel relatively little at this very high star quality. But imagine if they were to. Why? Well, here's an example. If we were to get five star linked data in government, we could actually set up places where we could use this data access language for the web over government data. And we could query the data, integrate and explore it across data sets, because now I will link the data in geography to the data in education, to the data in transport. And here is actually a, uh, a Sparkle query, because the data dot 
gov.uk site actually supports um, an access uh, mode in this way. And here I'm put. this is a, a, lot of, a, a lot of curly brackets, and we're not expecting people to become fluent in this, except the developers and other people who may wish to um, develop tools that sit on top of some of these formats. But actually, this is a, uh, a query that is asking us to give the constituency of all the schools that were closed in 2008. And that's a rough and ready reading of it. This is one of the examples. This is a particular school closed, a particular school closed in this parliamentary constituency. That's a URI from the statistics part of data.gov.uk. This is a URI for a parliamentary constituency. Well, what is that? Well, I can find out because I can put that into a browser and it turns out to be Ashford. And it's the same as this URI here. Now, these primarily for machines to link data together, so it's much easier to integrate applications. We're still working on the kind of browsers and interfaces that allow humans to interrogate this uh, easily, but this Ashford constituency contains these elements here, which can be dereferenced. Any of these can be dropped into our browser now and information given back. This, same as, what's that? Well, this is North Willsborough. Okay, so it turns out now that we have the ordnance survey view of the world of that piece of administrative geography. So we're linking across government data actually now in practice. And this allows us to develop what we can think of as a new kind of national infrastructure for schools and roads and bus stops and postcodes linking across building new kinds of applications. And these applications, my own research group here is integrating a bunch of this data together to give us a sense of, for example, deprivation or the health, economic and social health of regions. These are parts of Southampton where we're getting views on employment, income, training, crime and disorder and so forth. And finally, in the final part of this talk, let me talk about the challenges the challenges that this is going to throw up. Well, actually, this view of the world that I have described needs a lot of computation. Where is all this very great amount of data going to live? Uh, in the cloud? Uh, Who will bear the cost of supporting it? Will government be running this large-scale commercial, this large-scale information infrastructure for linked data? Because if I can access it uh, using complex queries, I can be putting up a huge amount of computational demand onto the system. In fact, already without linked data, we have seen that when data is made available, the interest it can generate can melt the site. Okay. So there was a challenge. We hope, of course, that good old Moore's law, that the cost and power of what you can compute will also work in our favor, but there will be questions about who bears the cost of it. Can we really treat the web as a large decentralized database? There are hard challenges in core computer science here. And what about the dotsum and netsum, the, the data that you want to disregard, the data that becomes aged and retired and deprecated in various ways? What about data quality? Now, back to bus stops. Um, there were 360,000 bus stops, and it turned out about 18,000 errors. Now, this was in a nationally held database. There's always going to be mistakes and errors. Government is not omniscient, all-seeing, um, all-knowing. Uh, of course, the great thing is we can crowdsource the improvements. So just as we've seen earlier on that you can use those eyeballs and steal some of that time to improve, you can organize people. Exactly what's happened in this open street map attempt to correct the position of bus stops and improve our data. So opening data also offers the ability to improve it. The other favorite one here we hear about is interpretation. We can't trust people with the data because they might interpret it badly. Well, they always have. Okay? Uh, we're used to it. The papers do it all the time. Uh, this is famously a story that the Daily Mail ran about us being the most overcrowded nation in the European Union. Well, when you delve into the stats, it turns out that actually one of the arguments was that actually Holland is worse than we are. Um, it turns out that 
if you use one set of tables, that is, if you use one set of assumptions, well, we might be. But you'd have to assume that the 20% of the land mass of the Netherlands, which is underwater, was somewhere where Dutch people were living. Okay. So actually, you spin it differently, you come up with a different set of arguments, a different set of propositions. People are actually extremely good at arguing the pros and cons of data. Lots of eyeballs on data will often out the statistical um, misassumptions or inappropriacies. I think it speaks to a new level of data literacy that's really quite interesting, and that is something we perhaps do need to think about in inculcating a new view. Or this interesting uh, stu- uh, 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 graph here, this is where we're beginning to see these new open data sets being linked. This is US and UK crime statistics being linked together under some quite dodgy assumptions here about whether burglary and robbery really means the same thing in America and the UK. But again, you can begin to have these discussions about whether the assumptions in the data is correct. Another area where there is real concern is around privacy and security of this data. Uh, You will remember, of course, that famously this place, its position, actually its existence, was an official secret. Okay, And it was... uh, (laughs) Yes, it, was, it, was for, it required somebody to actually uh, assert parliamentary privilege to get, to, to get that out uh, into the public domain. But I think we knew it was there, more or less. What is perhaps more surprising is that this is real-time, site you can go to get real-time ship data about the nature, direction, and uh, 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 destination of all the ships in the world. A huge benefit for the marine insurance uh, companies who can now determine, for example, whether or not uh, two uh, ships were actually on the uh, uh, trajectories claimed for them when they collided, for example. AIS, a huge bone to the marine shipping agency. The downloaded iPhone version of this was a great bone for the Somali pirates, a great boon for them when they wanted to work out where the ships were that might be of interest. Okay. So there are dark and light uses of data. There always are. And the challenges here, people talk about the mosaic effect. Uh, Disparate information that in itself is of limited uh, use, once you take them together, can become much more powerful. Well, that applies to bad things, but also to good things. The data we will find combined in our open data in the UK will, I suspect, be used to hugely better effect than, the, uh, than, the, than those who worry about this suspect. But there are issues. I mean, this is data uh, that's mapped rather elegantly for San Francisco. This shows, uh, in a contour-based fashion, different times of crime. Um, and the point about all of this is that just relying on the fact that it was hard to know where things were happening in the pre-digital age, what we call practical obscurity no longer works, that you will be able to triangulate. What we need to develop are the new social conventions and legal agilities to deal with this new world. So I say finally that many of these issues are around policy and culture, and here in the UK we're leading this with uh, our public data principles, which speak to how you have to think about the balancing the public good against the issues around legitimate issues around security and disclosure. But this is a debate that is under discussion now, and I think it's beginning to change our culture. So finally, I would say, data is, of course, the basis of our open and modern scientific community. When Jon Snow first mapped cholera outbreaks to a map of London, they determined for the first time that cholera was a waterborne disease. This society began this process uh, in publishing scientific uh, journals in the uh, 1665. And it continues when we look at uh, data, whether it relates to climate or the effectiveness of new drugs and diseases. There is more and more data. We'll need more and more computing power in this global internet. We'll have a web of data connected. But I would say to you that actually... The web is humanity connected. And that what we're going to need to do is use our ingenuity to solve the problems that lay ahead and to seize the opportunities that a world rich in data 
can give us, to see the patterns and connections that can help us understand ourselves and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions, so I'd like to remind you, uh, gentlemen over here, if you could just wait for the microphone, stand up and off you go, please, uh, followed by the gentleman on the right there. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, right at the beginning of the talk, you showed a graph showing the growth of the internet. It's just carrying on. Yeah. Where do you see it slowing down and plattering? Where's the, where's the maximum going to plateau? Reach? Yeah. Well, I think we will find, we will look at that slope, I think. Of course, there's plenty more people in the world to get access to the web yet. So uh, in, in terms of the pure number of users, that's got some way to go. Um, it's likely that as compute power increases and as uh, ubiquitous computing increases, that people will carry around a cloud load of, if you like, IP addresses, the stuff that kind of makes the fabric um, of, of the web work. Uh, many devices will be consuming and exchanging uh, this new granularity of data. So Depending on where you measure it, I see this web accelerating for a very long time yet. I see no signs of particular slowdown here. Uh, what you will find is new modes of adoption, new ways in which the web is being recruited and used. Yes, um, William Heath, you did make the distinction that the data you were talking about, about numbers and stats and maps and, and, and um, assets, is distinct from personal data. But I wonder if we can go a little further, and I wonder if you think that distinction is absolutely crucial to preserving dignity of the individual, the culture of our power relationships. And I wonder if you, you anticipate uh, that there could be a similar cultural change and revolution in government's handling of personal data in the same way that there has been over several years in how it handles open data. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a crucial question for us to address as a society. Um, it's certainly the case that when we began this process, uh, and, 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 f and in many cases, the data is non-personal. Of course, one of the concerns is that more and more non-personal data begins to triangulate. This, in fact, is already a phenomenon understood in, in marketing, where people are looking at lots and lots of behavioral trails and can pretty well characterize you down to your postcode and possibly uh, uh, finer still. But that won't mean, that should not mean that we give up on the notion of privacy. In fact, I think we have to fight extremely hard to preserve the entitlements that it isn't good enough to say just because the information is there, it can be used. And if anything has to happen, I think the discussion around personal data has to be one in which we're given the rights to this data back to ourselves as individuals. And that will require us to come up with responsibilities and rights, I think, in that space. I'm Hadley Beeman. I'm working on a project called LinkedGov. We're looking to um, essentially organize the crowd around uh, cleaning and tidying and making useful reformatting, all the rest of it, um, all the data that's coming out of government. From your perspective, what would be the most useful area to, to focus the crowd on? What's the, the most grunt work that needs to be done? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, these are really exciting forms of engagement, so I think that's absolutely brilliant that that's happening at all. I think we do have to work out, as well, how we build a process where that process of improvement feeds back into, if you will, the, the data sets that government understands and owns. So I think there's, that, that, that uh, we, we need to think how this kind of versioning process and improvement process will work. In terms of what data uh, would it be best to go to work on, well, you know... Um, it starts with bus stops. It can carry on through to... It's surprising where the errors will be, I suspect. I mean, it, and again, it depends partly where you are. I learned uh, rather interestingly that, uh, that in Ireland, which aren't, uh, uh, doesn't have postcodes in the south of Ireland, they have a problem around not exactly knowing where the schools are. So uh, bus stops might, uh, might, 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 might not seem so important in that context. But what data needs to be improved? I think there's likely to be quite a lot of error in the large bulk data sets or issues around whether um, the right forms of redaction have happened. So the spending data that's going to be published, for example, or indeed um, it will be important when crime data starts to be reported more accurately, that people have a sense of, is this what they know has happened? Uh, but people will talk about this all the way through from bus stops to street lamps to nuisances to uh, um, issues around timetabling um, when the trains actually run to get you to the place you want to get to. 
gentleman over there, uh, followed by a gentleman over there. <coughs> Philip Coughlin, retired engineer. I'd like to ask you about your point about quality. Some of the information, or a lot of the information that would be released uh, could be provisional. It could be changed hourly, weekly, monthly. A lot of it would probably be quite uncertain, although the uncertainties possibly wouldn't be quantified. Yeah. Then when you're linking between sets of data with, with other sets of data that are similarly provisional and uh, unquantified in terms of uncertainty, these factors will possibly follow a kind of exponential, mm. um, what's the term I can use, inaccuracy. Mm. Now, do you think that eyeballing the data is sufficient really to overcome that? Right. And isn't there a danger that we'll be drawing all kinds of um, unjustified conclusions from people who don't really understand what the data is about? Great question. And actually, um, in the limits of a, a lecture like this, we don't have an, enough time to get into those issues around provenance. But actually, one of the answers to the question is you can't just rely on eyeballs. So certainly, one of the things we're developing in these representations of information is a detailed audit of the provenance. So where has this come from? Or the metadata, the information about the data itself that tells you something about the assumptions under which it was collected, how uh, timely it was, whether it is in fact likely to be uh, overtaken with, with new and better quality data, or the assumptions under which it was cleaned up or changed in some form or fashion. So absolutely, uh, that will be a key. Um, and I think that, again, what we will see in general as these data sets become more mature is, is a long tail here as well, that some data will be privileged and get to be used because there's a higher quality. Or, and the process of uh, understanding that data with certain attributes is to be preferred will tend to see the links flee to the quality data and not the poorer data. But that ecology is, is, is going to emerge too, I think, over time. Good evening, Professor Shadbolt. My name is Mark Smitham. Um, you've mentioned your star rating uh, system for users and organisations to put their information online, um, and you've also drawn attention to crowdsourcing. Um, I think it feels a little bit manual and time-consuming, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on automatic extraction of the information that's already present on the current web, as opposed to the semantic web and various hidden data stores through natural language processing sure. or wrapper induction, things like that. Sure. Well, it's certainly not the case. As a person with a background in AI, I have um, huge regard for, and I think there's a lot to be had in data mining and automated machine learning methods. And in fact, the semantic web originally, of course, was always conceived to be primarily about machine-based processing. The fact that uh, we now see a web which is a semantic web or a linked data web, which is people and linked data, I think is, again, just a recognition that put some rebalancing there. But much of the data that we might look at being um, processed into the web, and DPPD is a great example of it, the way they get a very large graph of data from Wikipedia is to use a lot of techniques that do information extraction off of documents in a classic way, uh, that do automated kind of uh, pattern extraction. So there will be absolutely a place for that, and um, not everything is going to be manually eyeballed, certainly. As somebody who's not a developer, do you think it realistic to expect that I would have uh, in anywhere near, in the near future access to a tool I could use to query linked data? And how could somebody like me keep in touch with what linked data is becoming available? Yeah. Okay, absolutely central question. When the original web was born, one of the key moments in it really becoming large scale was the provision of suitable browser technology, was the recognition that the UI, the user interface experience, had to be accessible uh, to a wider uh, range of people. And there is real and active work on looking to develop the tools that will allow the informed layperson to interrogate just this data. And what we've got in mind here are the signs of, I mean, the extent to which people already use spreadsheet tools and visualization tools to make sense of information laid out in, in very straightforward ways or to give them ways of revisualizing data sets. I, we are going to see that, uh, but I think that this is now a really important priority, that we don't keep this just a small developer-only uh, activity. And there, actually, interestingly enough, uh, we have the Open Government Data 
uh, camp in, uh, at UCL on Thursday and Friday where we're going to be seeing a lot of the developments from the developer community to more engage with uh, uh, interested citizens to do exactly this. So I think just this week we're going to start to see more examples that uh, will feel a lot less remote than the uh, curly brackets of the sparkle practitioner. Yeah. Somebody just there, jump over there. Uh, Dane Wright, I work in local government. I was wondering whether there are any key examples of the application of AI to this data, or is it too early to be able to do that as yet? Of AI to this data? Yes, or to, to government data in particular. So um, the, the kind of consumption of linked data in the way that, would, that, that, that you'd primarily think for AI, they will be around um, classic pattern extraction. They'll be around uh, methods to do with automated tagging and clustering of information sets. Uh, and that is certainly something that's beginning to emerge. So how do you... Or indeed looking at uh, trend analysis on top of this data. So there's certainly uh, work underway on that. It's interesting that AI sp spent quite a lot of its time in the early phase of looking at the semantic web, trying to do really quite advanced reasoning on top of this data. And that is typically really quite a hard thing to do. So one of the things we've been focusing on as a community is making the simple interconnectivity, interconnectivity between data a much more scalable phenomena. We think we'll see the AI apps appear as this web explodes at scale because then you'll have phenomena that you can really apply the methods to efficiently. There's a gentleman towards the back there. You kindly stand up so we can get you on the camera. Now we've got time for a couple more after this one. Sorry. Hi, uh, Andrew Kleiman. I work for a company called Dr. Foster Intelligence and we put information about hospitals uh, onto the website uh, for everybody to get access to. And one of the questions I always get asked is, um, does anyone really want to look at this data? Uh, you know, it's scary to people. That's my question. <laughs> do, do, we, do people want this data? Right, okay. Well, as somebody who works in health data, you will know that... Uh, and particularly Dr. Foster does well in convincing people they do want to look at this data because there are really important services that lie at the back of this. So um, um, infection rates in hospitals, a classic example, becomes important for people to know. Um, Clear-up rates, um, important to know. Waiting times, important to know. A whole raft of information that could be important. The thing about, I really didn't perhaps uh, uh, dwell on tonight, is... One of the propositions between put, about putting data up there is that you won't necessarily know at the point of publication how it will get used or whether it get used. So you don't make that assumption. You put it up there. And data reuse will have a long tail, just like the web's connectivity has this uh, power law, that some data will be highly, highly reused, and some data may be of interest to very, very few people. But that is not a reason for not publishing it. In fact, you want to see that, if you like, food chain of consumption, and we believe that will emerge. But certainly, uh, much, much uh, key open data will be of routine interest to many, many people most of the time. Not least, we, uh, we're beginning to see journalists. The media now talks about computational journalism. It talks about stories from data. So you can expect there will be even more arguments about immigration and the cost of price index, because people care about that data. OK, one more gentleman uh, over here, please. Um, so you work, in, uh, work with government and public sector um, where, if you like, the incentives for publishing data can be sort of centrally mandated. Um, so for, for local government, um, <laughs> right. the, the incentive to publish data is you've got to do it. Um, there's bound to be a lot of very useful data tied up in the private sector. Um, and obviously, the, quest, the answer to the question will vary depending on which particular example we're looking at. But have you given any thought to sort of generic incentives to private sector to release right. data as well? Great question. By the way... <laughs> It isn't entirely plain sailing in the public sector, whether you're mandated or not. <laughs> so uh, uh, people, uh, people have many reasons, some legitimate, but many reasons in the public sector to say, I don't think so, uh, or it's my data. Um, but in fact, there is huge reason to believe that 
the benefits of being open apply at scale to all types of organizations. And public sector bodies are beginning to be told to do it and are also starting to see the benefits, and many of them want to do it. In the private sector, there's a recognition that actually data sharing works for them too. Um, once upon a time, people didn't publish the inventories of stock they held. For example, books. Well, a particularly well-known e-commerce site, Amazon, decided it was a thing it could do and would do, and now everybody does. Uh, but in other areas, the sharing of data some, uh, between companies is an effective thing to do, whether it's in logistics supply chains, whether it's in uh, life science pharmaceutical companies who will share uh, certain results across the base. And the recognition is that perhaps sharing more and deciding where the real IP that it needs to protect and value needs to rest will become um, a balance that will shift, again, to the presumption of quite a lot being open. Okay, well, Nigel, you've got them going. What a, <laughs> well, great, uh, so. what a great lecture. We heard about data, government, five stars, four stars. Maybe we should have negative one, two, three, four stars. There are some. A little bit of, <laughs> a little bit of scary data as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, friends in cyberspace, uh, could you put your hands together with a warm thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.